Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of MHS Network. Uh, my guest today does not need any introduction whatsoever. I'm sure everyone knows him, but nonetheless, I guess for formalities, his name is Cliff Barrickman. I'm saying your last name correctly, right, Cliff? Cliff Barrickman. That's how I say it. So good, good enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I had to double check. I wanted sure. to correct you on these things, but I'm good with it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And uh, Cliff, again, I told you this before recording. Thank you so much for, for giving me the time today. It's an honor to have you on and pick your brain. So thank you so much. No um, so, yeah. So I guess the only way to really start this off, Cliff, I just wanted to ask you, how did you get into Sasquatch research? Oh, I was a little kid, basically. And I just love monsters, you know, Godzilla and the Universal Monsters and all that kind of stuff. And uh, but that was during the 1970s. So I had a. Um, I, I guess I was exposed to things like in search of and all that kind of thing, you know, mysterious monsters and all, all that sort of like the schlockumentaries that were on TV at the time. And uh, and so to me, Sasquatchers, Bigfoot was just another monster, you know, essentially I was scared of it and reminded me of the Wolfman and that sort of stuff. And I'm, I'm you know, I've always been a weird kid and I still am a weird kid in a lot of ways. Um, an eccentric individual, certainly. And uh, I kind of kept those eccentric interests over time. Um, but when I was in college, that's when the the page turned from just like, yeah, Cliff's a weird kid who's into weird things, the Crystal Skulls and Atlantis and all that other nonsense. But in college, I ran across a couple of books that were scholarly, uh, collections of scholarly articles written on Sasquatches, uh, like Man Like Monsters on Trial, or the, Sa or the scientist looks, like the, looks at the Sasquatch and all those sort of things. And that's when I started realizing like, holy smokes, people are doing science on this, you know? And I just devoured those books because I've always been a science nerd. And um, and after reading about the evidence and how it all kind of fit together like a puzzle, I decided like, well, like there's no way this, I mean, how, I, I could wrap my head around the idea that this could be all made up. Um, it just, those signs weren't there, you know? Um, so I started, I started camping and big like hiking and stuff in places where Bigfoots had been seen before. And um, I, you know, I ran across potential footprints my first time out and beginner's luck sort of thing. And that was back in 94. So I've been, you know, that's when the hook was set and I've been hopelessly drowning in the subject ever since. Gotcha. And you also recently, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, worked on a new book called The Freeman Bigfoot Files and helped out with that book. Uh, what was it like working on that, learning about uh, Paul Freeman and his research? Well, I've always been an advocate of Paul Freeman's um, evidence. Um, I never met the man. I wish I could have. Uh, I was bigfooting when Paul was alive still, but uh, I just we just never crossed paths. And um, for the first decade, a little less than a decade of my bigfooting career, I was doing it more or less alone because I'm I'm an introvert. Um, I'm a professional extrovert. Um, being a, I was an elementary school teacher and I was on television and I own a shop now and I, I'm a professional ex, extrovert. I'm good at it, but it's not my natural inclination. So I never had a chance to meet some of these people that I wish I could have, like Paul Freeman or Dr. Grover Krantz and people like that. They passed away too soon, essentially. But um, years ago, I, a woman reached out to me and um, it turns out it was Paul Freeman's daughter um, who recently passed away. Um, and she reached out to me and said, hey, I, uh, I'm Paul Freeman's daughter. I have his research map and we're looking for a good home for it. Um, and so I jumped at the chance. We rearranged something and now, now uh, I, I own the map, basically. It's hanging in the museum. And that's where I'm, I'm uh, doing this call from. You know, I'm, I'm in the stock room at the museum. I should do it actually out there where the cool stuff is to look at. But I'm in the stock room right now. And so I, I obtained Paul Freeman's map. Um, and it was, it's, it's fantastic. It's a great resource. Um, and, and like a year or two later, I, I got an email from Michael Freeman, uh, one of Paul's two sons. And, um, he basically said, yeah, you, you have my map. And I went like, what? You know, and like, and it's kind of awkward. And he, he, he's a cool guy. I mean, now we're really good friends. He's a very good friend of mine now. Um, but, but at the time I was like, whoa, I'm so, I, I totally understand your claim, you know? And, um, and, uh, and I gave him a high resolution copy of it and digital files and stuff. But at the end of the day, I have the map and I felt bad about it. But um, that kind of was the beginning of our relationship. And um, it's a little awkward first step, I'd say there. But um, he acknowledged that, well, you got it fair and square, but it really should belong to me. But I'm gonna, I'm not gonna put up a fuss about it, et cetera. Um, as well, that's that's good of you. And then um, last year, year before, I forget when. I've got a kind of elastic sense of time, so that's why I write things down. But um, uh, a year or two ago, uh, my wife and I 
we're going to go to um, Spokane, Washington, where Michael happens to live. I was going there to return an original cast to um, a researcher named Kevin Llewellyn. Uh, Kevin lent me an original cast that he obtained um, after immediately after seeing a Sasquatch. So we know it's, that's a Sasquatch cast. And so I wanted to drive it out there because I didn't want it to break in the mail. And also I was doing, um, I was digging up old stuff on the Bosberg prints, um, kind of a cold case that everybody has put to bed. But it turns out there was a lot more left to learn. Um, and Bosberg is right by Spokane. So my wife came out with me and I figured, well, God, I'm in Spokane. That's where Michael Freeman lives. So um, I reached out to Michael and we had lunch together and we kind of hit it off. You know, my wife is a horror movie fan and Michael has like, you know, horror movie icon tattoos on his arms and stuff. And, and you know, he, Michael is understandably apprehensive about a lot of people in big footing um, because so many people have thrown his family under the bus over the years um, from, from having a limited knowledge about the evidence, frankly. I'm going to be very honest and brutal about this. Um, the people who think uh, Paul Freeman are faking these things don't have an understanding of the evidence that is out there. Um, and... So it's a lot of misunderstandings there. So anyway, Michael and I we and my wife had lunch, kind of hit it off, and we started texting a lot more. And since then, we've become very good friends. Um, I was literally texting with him about 15 times today. Um, so at, at some point, I mean, Michael knew that I, I, I mean, after getting to know me a little bit, Michael knew that I knew my stuff. I knew the Paul Freeman evidence pretty well, um, as well as almost anybody, really. Um, there's me and Meldrum and, and Michael, essentially, and that's kind of it. Um, so Michael, when, um, I, I gave Michael, see, Dr. Meldrum lent me his copy of the Paul Freeman photo album at one point. And, um, so I, I shared that with Michael cause he didn't have a copy with, uh, of it, you know? And if you, well, this is your dad's stuff, even though he gave it to Meldrum, this is your dad's stuff. You should at least have a copy of it. Um, and from that photo album and the stuff that Michael had, um, this idea was born through Doug Hijack, another good friend of mine, uh, to make a book about the Paul Freeman files. And when they started piecing again, they wanted to put out a lot of these photographs that no one had ever seen before. And then Michael reached out to a variety of people who he trusted and was familiar with uh, and knew that was also familiar, the, who were familiar with the Freeman evidence. Um, so I was in there. Um, Tom Powell did a nice interview with uh, Mike. Uh, Paul Freeman right before he died. So Tom was invited. Uh, Michael Freeman, of course, wrote a chapter. I, I did too. Uh, Meldrum wrote one. And then Dar Addington wrote one. Um, I'm good friends with Dar Addington, another big footing legend that is almost unheard of. Nobody knows who she is, uh, which is a shame because she was instrumental in a lot and document documenting a lot of these really important cases in the blues back in the day. Um, so she got involved in it as well. In fact, uh, I got a really sweet uh, text from Michael just a short while ago that, uh, see, Michael got the book shipments today. They arrived at his house today. So Michael is busy autographing them um, to send to the North American Bigfoot Center because we're going to be selling them here. And so I, we want to sell autograph copies because that's kind of one of the niche markets we can delve into since I have good relationships with most people in the Bigfoot world who are authors. So um, uh, Michael uh, was signing them today and he sent a photograph of Dar Addington's chapter to her and she cried, you know, so it was very, very sweet. So um, that's basically how it happened. And it's still happening right now. Um, like I said, Michael is signing those books for me right now, probably literally as we speak, unless he's done. And I'll put those in the mail the next couple of days. We'll start selling them this week. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to turn a lot of heads. And I think it's going to turn a lot of pages on people's view of the Freeman evidence. Because it's one thing to say that Paul Freeman's a hoaxer. But what these people who are, are, who are unaware of the Blue Mountain evidence or fully unaware of the scope um, uh, and depth of it is that you can't say Paul Freeman was a hoaxer because Paul didn't get all that evidence. Paul cast maybe 50 or 60 footprints over those 20 years and oh that's so many not really that's like three a year on average and some years he didn't find any and sometimes he would cast five in a row up from the same trackway so then to say that to throw all the blue mountain evidence out because they didn't like paul freeman in some sort of way or they didn't like something he said or something he said didn't sit right with them well that's also throwing not only Paul under the bus unnecessarily, that's throwing um, Wes Summerlin, um, the uh, professional tracker and wildlife guy, basically, um, uh, and uh, Bill Lowry, a uh, wildlife biologist, and Dar Addington, um, and uh, uh, Vance Orchard, and I mean, all these people, uh, David Bean, another professional man tracker and law enforcement guy, all these people are just thrown out, like baby with the bathwater. We'll talk about that, man. All these people are their names are being or besmudged because of 
what some of the old timers said about Paul Freeman, that he was too lucky. So therefore, everything that he did was fake. It's nonsense. So what's new going on in the research field? I know you talked about the book and everything, but what's going on in, you know, Sasquatch research that is most exciting to you right now? Well, I mean, I don't know what other people are doing. I don't think there's a lot really going on. People seem to be harping on the Patterson-Gimlin film still. I think it's a great film. And if you don't think it's real by now, nothing's really going to change your mind. Um, but I don't, I don't, I'm not one of these people that, you know, pounds, you know, that, that beats a dead horse, so to speak. I think the PG film is a, is the, it set the bar. So now what? Let's go out and get another piece. You know, get, that's what my focus is at this point. Um, for me personally, I mean, again, again, I don't know what other people are up to. I don't really care. I don't like the people thing very much. I'm not, um, I'm a, like I said, I'm a professional extrovert. My, my, I'm a, you know, I'm a quiet person who keeps to myself, frankly. Um, that is, I, what I see is not a lot going on. People seem to be chasing, like, sighting reports continue to happen and people interview witnesses. Okay, that's kind of beating a dead horse too, but it does feed our knowledge a little bit. I, I take reports. We took two or three in the museum just today um, and one from the local area. So there's another dot on the map, which is essentially what a sighting report is at this point. Um, anything more than a week or two old is a dot on a map. And, and that's all you can really do about it. Um, if it's fresher than that, you can go out and try to pull footprints or find out some sort of spore or trace evidence or something like that. But at this point, sightings are just a dot on a map. Um, but I don't think anyone else is doing much, honestly. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not a vocalization guy. To me, they're novel, but I'm not an expert in that. Don't I send it to people who care more than I do, and they seem to like it, so that's cool. Uh, sighting reports, I got one today from... Um, where was it? Oh, Indiana. I got one from Indiana today. Um, so I filed that away because what good is that to me? But it's interesting. It's interesting. And there wasn't any particularly interesting behavior in that or anything as well. For me, the interest is my own local area where I can get to. And I'm what I'm trying to do is figure out where these things are going and also which of these individuals are going there. Um, I, I think footprints are the most important thing that any of us could be doing at this point unless you're carrying around a gun trying to kill one of these things and i'm not i'm not a gun guy i don't i think it would be uh, not only inappropriate but dangerous for me to try to do that I'm, I, i've got a couple of firearms i'm not against them in any way but i'm not a gun guy i'm not qualified to do that so i'm not doing that i'll leave that to the nawac and those guys right um but I, for, so for most people who aren't carrying around, you know, grizzly bear guns or polar bear guns with them. Um, I think the most important thing to do is gather and collect footprints because um, most wildlife biologists study mammals by their trace evidence. Um, they don't go out and count bears. They don't go out and count wolverines. What they do is go out and look for sign of bears and wolverines or whatever other mammal they're studying. And then through that, they can learn a little bit about individuals and territory size and social interactions and population and a variety of other things that are of interest when you're studying an animal. So um, in my particular area, there's three or four study areas that we have that are all within two hours of where I live. Um, the closest being 15 minutes or so from where I live and the furthest being about an hour and a half or so, hour 45 from my house. Um, and these are the areas we've been gathering evidence out of. And, and But the evidence comes in slowly and not a lot happens. Um, so we're out there, we, and I say we, I mean, it's basically my, me and my close confidence, my confidants, I should say, the team here at the North American Bigfoot Center and a few other friends. Um, we go to these areas and if something happens, we share it. We try to get out there as much as possible while the animals are in the area, try to gather footprints, um, and our best area, we nickname it Easter Island. You know, and any, if, you're, if any of our any your listeners are a member of the North American Bigfoot Center, they're very familiar with Easter Island. Um, if you're a member, we produce two short documentary videos every single month um, of our field excursions and all that kind of thing that we Bigfoot nerd stuff that we do here at the museum, and um, we put it out twice a month. So whenever we go to Easter Island or the Willows or the Blueberry Bog or any of these things. These, these pseudonyms that we have for our locations out in the woods, we post videos about it so you can see what we're up to. Um, Easter Island um, is a spot not too far away. It, it, it's generally down the Clackamas River a ways um, and up in the mountains there. But uh, we have pulled four 
four footprint casts, or at least four, we found at least four trackways, I should say, and some of them have yielded more than one cast, so that's not fair to say. We have found four footprint uh, trackways and had a sighting. Um, and we also found footprints there, so that's five, really, in the last two years. So it's a very, very good area. As far as Bigfoot goes, that's that's red hot, right? So we are just going out there as much as possible. Um, right now, it's not even possible to get there because it's under snow, fortunately. Um, but that's where the focus is for me, at least right now, trying to gather footprint cast evidence because it turns out, um, much like uh, orca researchers, um, wildlife or uh, marine biologists, um, they can identify individual orcas by by marks on their dorsal fins and tail fins and that sort of thing. Well, it turns out you can do that with Sasquatches. Um, th there are marks and, and configurations of toe and like shapes of their their hallux in particular, their big toe, um, that you can tell individuals. So if you get a cast from here of the same in one individual and you find the same individual, you know, six miles away, that's starting to tell you things. It's starting to inform a little bit uh, about how they live and where they go and what they need and stuff. So that's where um, my focus is. Um, and again, if you're not carrying a gun, I think that's probably the most important thing you can be doing. So. Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, you kind of already addressed this, but if you you know feel the need to add anything in there, I was going to ask you, how do you do your field research and what are the things that, like you said, you kind of already answered that, but what are the, some of the things that you're looking for, for people who are maybe trying to get into this, who are trying to go out there and, and do their research? You know, what is your advice? How do you go about doing that? I'd say walk the roads slowly. Um, uh, like really slowly, actually. Um, that's what we're doing. We we have an area, there's one or two roads that we know of that aren't well graveled. There's a couple inches of mud on them. Um, so they retain footprints pretty well because gravel roads, you're kind of stuck. There's not a lot you can do. Although off to the side of the roads, there's very often good tracking substrate there. But there's a couple roads that we know of uh, in this particular area that um, are pretty muddy. There's not a lot of gravel on them and the gravel's pretty thin and um, where it is present. Um, so we, we go out and th this, this whole stretch, like we've, those four or five footprints, they're all found within a half mile of one another, a half mile. So I take a few hours, probably once a week, once every other week at this point, cause the weather's all crappy right now. Um, although I might go tomorrow, but it's supposed to be raining. We'll see what happens. Um, and it's under snow, like I said, so I'm not even sure we'd be able to get there, but, um, basically go out and slowly walk the roads, um, really slowly. Um, it takes about an hour or more to cover that half mile stretch because um, we're looking, we're looking at very closely. And then I, then we walk back and look again because uh, one of the first sets of footprints that were found on this road, I didn't find it, but uh, two of my team members were there um, and uh, they missed it on the way in. They saw it on the way out, but they missed it on the way in. So um, that's kind of the method that we go for walks it's not rocket science and you go for walks and you look down and you go really slowly yeah. and that's kind of most of it i like I do it. it during the day now too I, I i haven't gone out at night um since uh october at this point um because I, i'm i'm kind of thinking to myself well it's harder to find footprints at night so forget that and uh also if i have a sighting at this point i've already seen one i saw one through a therm back in 2011 but I, if i see another I'd kind of like it to be during the day. So I'm, I'm going during the day a lot more than I used to. Um, not that nighttime's bad or anything like that. I still love camping in the woods. Um, but at the same time, when I go to this spot, I, I usually go during the day. Gotcha. Yeah, and I like that because I think that's simple for everyone too. I think sometimes, I know I'm guilty of kind of over overcomplicating things and whatever, but yeah, I'd like kind of this, you know, the simple approach of just, you know, walking and being aware of your surroundings and taking your time and looking around for sure. Well, yeah. And, you know, frankly, it's just good for you, too. I mean, you look up, I think the term is a, a green bath or something like that. Um, we've really domesticated ourselves as a species to the point of mental illness, of living in towns and all this other stuff. Going for a walk in the woods for any reason is good for you. I know it really helps me a lot. Um, but it's good for everybody. It's good for your body and mind and soul. Um, I would suggest everybody do this. You know, even if you don't think Bigfoots are there, go for a walk in the woods anyway. Mm -hmm. You're actually in, um, making the world a better place by doing so. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, so again, random questions. Uh, what's your thoughts on Bigfoot types? I know that's something people talk a lot about, you know, certain areas or regions of the country. They look different, apparently. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. I don't think there's any reason to think that we're dealing with more than one species here in North America. Um, in other parts of the world, all bets are off. Like, are the, um, you know, the Yeren of China, is that, a sim is that exactly the same as a Sasquatch, the same species? I don't know. Who knows? We're not going to know that until we get dead ones of both. And then that's going to, that's probably a long ways off. Um, but certainly things like the Orang Pendek, that's not a Sasquatch. That's a very, very different animal. Um, but here in North America, just because they're different colors or they behave differently or anything, or they're bigger or smaller, none of that matters. I mean, that, look at you and I, we're the same species um, and you you have dark hair and I don't. And I, and I'm, I don't know, I'm not very tall, man. I don't know how tall you are, but I had a six foot four guy in earlier today. He's the same species as me. Um, and we had a, a couple of people that were two feet tall to in here today too. Like this two year old, that was three year old that was in here, same species. Um, there's no reason to think that we're dealing with more than one species. Uh, people, the humans um, have a pretty, uh, uh, they, they, they lack understanding in, what, in animals, especially the apes. They think apes are stupid. You know, always, they, I, I get a lot of hate mail um, for some reason. Um, and, and, what, and, a lot, and some of the people who send me hate mail say, you just think the Sasquatches are dumb apes. And I'm thinking, well, you're kind of acting like one right now because you don't understand what apes are. Apes are not dumb at all. Um, uh, uh, apes uh, are, are extraordinary animals with with uh, symbolic thinking capability. Um, they don't have language because their brains don't have fine motor control to manipulate their tongues and mouths like we do. But uh, other than that, they're very, very similar. They mourn their dead. They have understanding. Like it, it, it's phenomenal. Um, if, if, to say a dumb ape, that, that I don't know. That that's like saying a short giant. It just doesn't make any sense. It's such an oxymoron. So um, uh, I don't know. So yeah. But anyway, there's all that. But I don't see any reason to think that there's more than one species here in North America. The footprint tracks all look the same. Um, the behaviors are more or less similar as far as my eyes go. Um, coloration, who cares? You know, because Sasquatches have the the um, they have a long lifespan. All apes do. Humans are apes, and we do too, right? But all great apes, uh, gorillas, orangutans, chimps, humans, um, we all have a natural lifespan of the 50-year range, somewhere in there, give or take a little. There's no reason to think Sasquatches are dramatically different. Um, so they live a long time. They don't, and they also have a low birth rate. They don't have litters of babies at a time. I think that's a reasonable thing to say. They're not like white mice, you know, who have a ton of a ton of babies at once. And a uh, long life and low birth rate is, is a pointer towards a wide genetic diversity. So we should expect a lot of body types, hair colors, um, skin color, all that sort of stuff. Should, uh, eyes, all these things um, are, are, are sign markers to say that, yeah, we're dealing with a great ape here. Um, they, they're a wide genetic diversity. There's a really wonderful mosaic poster out there um, of just the face of a bunch of chimpanzees and bonobos and some other apes. And, and you go, oh, very, very different. You just look at each one as you go through the poster and they're very, very different. They are individuals and they look like it. Um, and Sasquatches would be the same thing. So uh, the people who say, oh, they look different. That doesn't make a new species, man. Oh, they act different. Uh, the ones in the South are more aggressive. I hear that a lot. I don't think it's true, but I hear that a lot. Uh, well, that doesn't make a new species. Um, species uh, is a different thing. So there you go. So kind of brought up in the beginning, um, you're talking about how you got into, you know, Sasquatch research, like, you know, the other, you know, cryptids or whatever. Is there any other cryptids? I know obviously your focus is Sasquatch, but is there any other cryptids out there that interest you or you kind of maybe research or look into a little bit at all? Mm -hmm. Not really, no. I mean, I have a I have a tangential interest in like those river serpent things, just because I've spoken to some really compelling witnesses, and I think they're probably real. Yeah. But I don't research it. I, I, that research is a pretty strong word for me. Um, but outside of the hairy hominoids, um, I don't. I've got other things to do, you know, and I barely have enough time to do them. So. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, thoughts on Dogman? 
I don't know. I would think that there's no ecological niche for them. And if it wasn't for two individuals that I know, I would say there's nothing to it. It's all nonsense. Um, but I do have two individuals um, that I've spoken to. Well, one was a former family member, a relative of my ex-wife. Um, and another is a good friend of this day. And both of these individuals, they both happen to be male. Both these guys say that they saw one and there was nothing else it could have been. Uh, one guy saw one from about five or six feet away. And this guy's like law enforcement, like high level, like government law enforcement guy. Well, um, then when he told me the story is covered with goosebumps and you just can't fake that stuff, you know, not that he would lie to me anyway. Um, and the other guy is a personal friend I've known for many years now. And he thought he called, he described what he, as what he saw as a demon. But basically what he was describing was a, a dog man or whatever those things are. Um, I've got no interest in those, really. Um, I've seen no good evidence for them at all. Uh, all. All we have are a bunch of stories. And the stories don't really do it for me. Again, because I mentioned earlier in the same interview that, um, you know, even sighting reports, which are basically stories, all they are to me is a dot on a map. Um, but I don't see the history for dog man. I don't see like historical newspaper accounts for these things. Um, I don't I've never seen a footprint of a purported dog man that I found compelling. Um, I don't see the ecological niche. I, there's a lot of things missing here. So if, if these things are real and I think there's something going on, I don't know what that something is, but if there's any, whatever the reality is behind dog man, as far as I'm concerned, I, maybe it's something that's truly paranormal, you know, whatever that means. Um, and those, I'm not really interested in the paranormal. I'm interested in biology. You know, so I stick with things that I think have a biological reality, and Sasquatch is just one of those things. But Dogman, yeah, I know people are loving it. Bobo loves it, for example. <laughs> yeah. He talks about it on the podcast every chance he gets. Um, but I've got nothing to say about it. I've never experienced those things. I, I know two witnesses that I find compelling. I've spoken to others, but I don't know those people. I don't know if they're nuts. I don't know. I don't. I don't know anything about it. Um, but of those two people I know, they're they're sane. They're competent observers. Um, so there's something going on. I just don't know what it is. And luckily I don't care. I wanted to ask you, so um, thoughts on the nature of Sasquatch. And by that, I mean, you know, throughout your time doing your research for all these years, has your thoughts changed at all? You know, relic hominid, um, you know, any of these other possibilities? I mean, where are you at right now in regards to, you know, what you think these creatures might be? Okay. Yeah. Um, and my thoughts change a lot. Um, when more information comes in, I have, I form a better picture. Everybody has a model, right, of what they think is going on, um, whether we're talking about, you know, Bigfoot or anything else, right? There, we form a model in our brain. And, and, you know, the model gets sculpted over time as income incoming data changes and, and experiences as well. Um, data is different than experiences in, in my mind. Um, and my, my personal experience experiences um, combined with the data that I've seen um, and gathered over time just indicates these things are a perfectly normal animal out there. Um, uh, I, I suspect they're a hominin. Um, hominin is a fancy word that means anything on the human family tree since we broke off from chimpanzees about six million years ago or so. So even if it didn't lead to us, like Neanderthals, um, they, they weren't on our, they were a branch of our of our lineage, but they didn't lead to us, evolutionarily speaking. Um, they're also hominins, um, just like Homo uh, erectus or uh, um, Homo habilis or the Australopithecines or any of those things. They're all hominins because they came after our breaking off from the chimpanzee um, common ancestor with us. Um, I suspect that's where Sasquatches are. Um, I'm not a huge advocate of the Gigantopithecus theory, uh, although it's possible. I think they're a good candidate. Um, I just don't that I wouldn't put that one first is all. So I, I suspect these things are probably some sort of ro robust Australopithecine, uh, Paranthropus, in other words, um, that happened to radiate out of Africa and head north. And um, they got bigger as they went north because of Bergman's rule which is a biological rule that states within a, uh, even within a species, animals that live in colder regions um, get bigger. And it has to do with um, uh, the uh, if you, surface area to mass ratio, ratios, basically. Um, a bigger animal retains heat better. So an animal that lived in like the, the tropical Africa, if they left Africa and headed north through the Himalayas and, and up into the Siberia area in the colder regions where they wouldn't necessarily have to be to cross the land bridge over to North America, um, they would eventually get larger over a few generations or so, you know? And really, Paranthropus, they're five feet tall, five and a half feet tall or something like that. They were basically Bigfoots to begin with. 
like everything about them. Like uh, you, you look at the, the the skulls of a paranthropus. It has the sagittal crest. It has the zygomatic arches for the anchoring the chewing muscles and all that sort of stuff. They were basically Bigfoots that were five five and a half feet tall. Um, it give and the last uh, the the most recent fossil we have of these things about eight hundred thousand years ago. Eight hundred thousand years. It's not that long ago. Um, and give them a million years, five foot to eight foot doesn't seem like a big jump for a million years of evolution. So that's my thought right now. Um, and I'm not the guy who thought that up, by the way. Um, uh, it turns out that um, a guy, um, what was his name? He just passed away in 2017 or 18 or something, maybe 19. Um, he lived in, here in Oregon. What was his name? He, was a, he wrote a paper and published it in about 1970, um, speculating that um, Patty in the Patterson-Gimlin film might have been a robust australopithecine. Oh, what is his name? I should... I'm, the older I get, the more names I lose. I, I couldn't even think of the word comfort the other day in the middle of the sentence. Um, it'll come to me. But I don't I, even, I can't, sorry, I'm not able to help you out more. I should be a little more educated myself on that. But um, no, I, I like your thoughts on that. And yeah, I was just going to, I started looking into that just recently because I just, uh, I went on the Smithsonian's website and they have a whole chart with, yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. It's like uh, artist reproductions of various hominins and stuff. Yeah, right? mm -hmm. yeah, and super interesting. Yeah, so I'm very new. To Gordon Strassenberg is his name. Gordon Strassenberg. Is his okay. Name. You've gotten, I'm sure, countless eyewitness reports. You know, like you were saying, it kind of becomes just a dot on a map. But is there an eyewitness report that you've gotten that just kind of sticks with you? Well, you know, um, not all sighting reports are a dot on the map for me. Um, and some of the ones that stick with me are the ones that show interesting behaviors. Because most of the time people see a Sasquatch, they're honestly, most of the time they're running across the road in front of a car. That's, that's what most of them are. Um, and then I think second in line are people who are camping who happen to see one or something like that. But, um, but there are a few of them that have really interesting behaviors that I find uh, to be very interesting, like fascinating. Um, for example, uh, I, I believe I have two reports of them um, reportedly hitting a tree with another stick or branch, making a tree knock. And I think that's interesting. Um, but I've got three reports of them clapping. That's cool. Uh, which just indicates that they make these tree knock noises, whatever they're doing, with, through a variety of means. Um, and maybe that's not even it. Maybe they do it chest beating and maybe they do noises with their mouth or whatever. Um, but, you know, that gives us a little bit more information. Um, some of the more interesting behaviors, uh, there's a gentleman who saw one in Stevenson, Washington, um, literally inside town, I think, actually. Um, it was very, very late at night. And frankly, you only own your property during the day, as Tom Powell says. Um, this thing, uh, he almost hit it in his car and then it, and, and he car came to a halt and it's like 12 feet in front of him and, and the headlights and one of his headlights was like cocked up like that because his kid hit a pole a few months earlier or something and they never fixed it um so this thing's full lit up 12 feet from the where the guy's sitting and the, th the thing screams at him and then it holds his arm out to the left or uh, it was the left arm actually so his left arm like that and he took that as like get the hell out of here so he did he left um but that's interesting what were they trying to do there what was the sasquatch doing he interpreted like pointing like you get out but although it wasn't pointing his hand was just hanging loosely like that um there's been a couple other reports of them um like ra raising an arm like that like waving it didn't wave but it just raised his hand up like that that's cool um those sort of uh, behaviors are very intriguing we don't know what they mean um but they're very intriguing and, and if you think you know what they mean you might but you're probably wrong because we have no idea where it's coming from and we interpret everything as a human would um for like for example there was a bigfoot scene up in british columbia um i forget what decade it was but it was many decades ago and they always called him old smiley because whenever they saw this thing it would go like smile at him and I've, I've spoken to witnesses who have seen them smile as well um but and oh it was smiling at me he said no it wasn't uh, when an ape bears its teeth it's a stress reaction you know so the people are interpreting as oh it's a smile it's smiling at me no it was stressed out man it was stressed out that it was being observed apparently because it, it, it bared its teeth at you <laughs> that's 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 not a friendly gesture well, I don't know why my light went so much, but um, yeah, that that that's not a friendly gesture. That that that's that's a threat in a way, you know. So we don't know what what they're doing, but I think it's those are the reports that I find most interesting. 
Um, unless they're like in my backyard virtually, but like uh, the point on a map in my backyard is great, but when it shows interesting behavior, that's really cool. What does the research community need to do better? Get along and encourage one another, essentially. Um, because uh, we're, we tend to be stubborn people. Uh, all of us tend to be pretty stubborn people. And uh, John Green noted that. I think he called us pig-headed, if I remember correctly, um, because we're the ones out there looking for things that everybody else tell, says doesn't exist. Um, but besides that, as far as the actual research part goes, I think that um, the people need to focus more on the animals instead of themselves. I, I, I see a lot of... Uh, um, Facebook in general and social media and that sort of thing t t t t it tends to draw attention to oneself and the, the best researchers and even a group or two that I am aware of, they don't really draw attention to themselves. They do this because they love it. Um, and if they share with their, their close friends or other researchers who they trust, um, you know, because the community is a, a vitriolic place essentially. Um, I, I, yeah, maybe that's it. I, I think that um, one needs to do one. One is best um, when one does this because you love it, not for attention. I think the need for attention is a mental illness um, that per, that permeates society today. Essentially, it's not just bigfooting; it's society in general, um, and influencers. You know, look at me, look at me, and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think that the best way to get recognized is to do something that is worthy of recognition. And and then I think most people who get the recognition um, realize the curse that it is. And like you said, this is one of the biggest mysteries out there. And a lot of people talk about it as if, you know, they're experts or whatever. And it's just weird to me. It's weird. I, you know what, man? That very. There's not a lot of people who spent more time in the woods than me. I'm not bragging or anything, but I don't consider myself an expert. I consider myself a learner, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and and I just enjoy the journey. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't. You know, I, I perhaps know more. I, maybe I'm an expert on the subject, but I'm certainly not an expert on the animals. You know, I've got a lot of learning to do, and I enjoy that. I, I enjoy that part of it probably more than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, getting a good lead and being out in the woods and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's, it's exhilarating. I, I just enjoy it. I, I would be doing it if, uh, um, if no one wanted to talk to me on podcasts, or if I wasn't on TV shows, or if I didn't own a Bigfoot museum, I would be doing this anyway, you know? And I think that's what um, I think people, uh, the community should perhaps focus on, focus on the animals, not on being recognized for something because fame is not what you think it is. 100%. Yeah. And if there's anyone that knows, it's definitely you. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully that at least resonates to some extent with people. Yeah, including myself. Um, so what's next for Cliff? Just doing what I do, man. I mean, I, I mean, I've got a few gigs coming up. I've um, got a, a couple potential trips to take. I'm hoping to get out to the coast mm -hmm. of British Columbia um, the next couple months. Um, we'll see if that happens or not. Uh, it's a matter of money and getting time away. And I have very little time or money, honestly. So we'll see if I can manage that or not. Um, but at this point, it's just focusing on the North American Bigfoot Center, um, trying to make this place better every single day I'm here. Um, you know, it's not easy to pay your bills by Bigfoot. And essentially, that's what the museum is doing for me. I was paying my bills. I'm not I'm not going to be rich from this ever. Um, there's just no money in it. But I can pay my bills and I can go to the woods and I can get the fresh leads on Bigfoot stuff. And uh, and I can spend a lot of time doing what I love to do. So um, just today, I, I, I finessed a couple more of our displays here in the back you know, on the other side of this wall here. Um, last week, I put two new displays up. So I'm always changing it around. I'm always doing something. Um, but besides that, just trying to get to the woods and trying to learn a little bit more about these things. So I love that. Uh, it's kind of simple. It's just I, I, I'm a simple guy at the end of the day. I'm a simple, eccentric weirdo, you know. So. I hear you. Same here. Yeah. And um uh, Cliff, so is there any, I know you talked about the North American uh, Bigfoot Research Center. Uh, obviously, you have your podcast with Bobo that everyone already knows about, but is there anything you want to plug or, you know, ways to direct people uh, to anything that you want them directed to? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. You can come hear me talk if you want, I guess. <laughs> I, I, do, I, do, I do talks around the country. I got one in, I have one in, uh, in Washington. I'm doing Squatch Fest, it's called. 
um, uh, Kelso Longview area in Washington the last weekend of January. Um, I'm doing a couple gigs in Ohio. I got the Ohio Bigfoot Conference and I'm doing that stuff for, uh, I forget what it's called, Monster or something rather for uh, Seth Breedlove. That's up in Minerva, Ohio. That, I think those are in like maybe May or June or something. Um, sounds like I'm going to be back at Gatlinburg this year in Tennessee. Um, yeah, I've got a few other things, off, but off the top of my head, those are the ones I remember right now. Um, seems like I'm forgetting an important one, but I don't remember what that is. Oh, I'll be up in Forks, Washington. That's another one. I think that's in April or May or something. I don't remember. I don't know. If it's not in the next two weeks, I don't pay attention. Um, but really, that's about it, man. Just I, I'm doing the Bigfoot Center thing, and I'm here most days. And when I'm not here, I might be in the woods or hanging out with my wife. So. Awesome. And Cliff, I just want to take this time. That was the final question. I just want to say thank you because um, I don't think you get the recognition that you deserve. I know for you know finding Bigfoot in that show – for a lot of people, like I watched that when I was a kid, that was my first exposure to the subject. And for a lot of people, that was their exposure. And, you know, I think you paved the way in a lot of different ways. And I just want to say thank you for all of your research and your years dedicated to researching this subject and um, helping educate the public on these creatures. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, um, I understand that I was the first exposure for your generation. For, uh, I, I wasn't the first. There was another show in 2001 or something like that, uh, Mysterious Encounters. It was a Doug Highcheck thing. Um, he did, went on to do a monster quest. And if you ever see that show, um, the main host was a wonderful researcher named Autumn Williams, but Bobo was on it. Uh, Moneymaker made appearances on it as well. So it's kind of fun to go back and dig those things up. I think they're probably on, online somewhere or something like that. Not a bad show. And a lot of the old time researchers that have kind of faded, they're still out there like Rick Knoll and those guys. They're still out there doing the stuff, but you can see them on the shows. We weren't the first. Um, we were just probably the most popular so far, I think is what it was. And we, I, and honestly, we just got lucky, man. Uh, at the end of the day, Bobo would agree with me, but we're just nerds. You know, I mean, actually, he would disagree with me. What am I saying? But what takes great offense. <laughs> um, we're, we're just we're just uh, people who um, are deeply curious about this thing. And an opportunity came up and we jumped on it at the end of the day. And we got very lucky to end up on Animal Planet, who backed us up on the research side instead of the superficial television side, um, which is what I think a lot of TV is nowadays, unfortunately. Um so, yeah, I mean, I appreciate you watching it. But even though it was a TV show, get your science from books, uh, not TV is my recommendation. You know, I mean, we, we didn't lie or anything like that. We, if we said we heard something, we did. Mm -hmm. If we said we believe somebody or don't believe somebody, that's the truth. Maybe we're wrong, but we never lied. And that's something to be proud of. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And since you, you brought it up, book recommendations for people out there who want to, you know, be more knowledgeable on the subject. Uh, Sasquatch, Legend Meets Science by Dr. Jeff Meldrum. That's your first one. Your second stop is Dr. Grover Krantz's book, uh, Bigfoot Sasquatch Evidence. And then uh, if you can find them, get Dr. John Bindernagel's books. Uh, there's two of them, uh, Sasquatch, the North American Great Ape, and then uh, the Discovery of the Sasquatch. Um, those are very hard to find because John's dead now and uh, they're out of print. But if you can pick those up, do it. And you'll notice all three of those books, um, Dr. Meldrum, Dr. Krantz, Dr. Binderdottle, all three scientists. I stick with the scientists, the ones who have the, in the biological sciences. You'll be, you'll be fine. So, hey, thank you so much, Cliff. Um, I know we're approaching that hour mark. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to me and uh, share your experiences, your knowledge. Um, we will see you. Hopefully, I'll one day make a trip up to. Uh, to your museum and, and visit you and see the see the museum i've heard a lot of good stuff about it so well thank you well, you know uh, uh, if, if, uh, to suffer through one more plug you can always be a member of the museum i don't know where do you live by the way i'm in oklahoma oklahoma oh, very good mm -hmm. very good great place um yeah but for people who don't live in the pacific northwest you can be a member and um and members get, get kind of weekly updates on the museums and new displays that we're doing but the real joy of being a member is that twice a month you get video documentaries that we make and produce in shop twice a month they're not long they're between you know eight and 20 minutes long for the most part but when we go to the field like tomorrow if we're if i if i go out to the field we bring cameras we just film it and we just give we give you what we do so if you're interested in what we're doing and what we're finding um we've been producing two of these things every single month for two or three years now 
So check it out. Maybe it's something for you. Six bucks a month. You can go to NorthAmericanBigfootCenter.com and uh, click the membership button and I'll tell you what you need to know. Absolutely. And we'll provide a link uh, down in the description box. So if you're interested in that, please description box, hit that link and become a member of support Cliff. Uh, thank you again, Cliff. Thank you everyone for watching at home and we will see you guys next time. Thank you.